<clears throat> All right. Well, good to see everyone today as you are finding your seats. Um, we are, uh, does anyone need a folder? Does anyone need a folder that doesn't have one? All right. Here you go. Yep. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, Pastor Don, we do have those cards circulating. Was there anything else you wanted to say about that? No? Okay. One of our youngest members, yes. <clears throat> All right. So we, to let everyone know where we are, you have a few handouts uh, kind of preloaded in those folders. We were just still finishing the introduction part two. So we're going to do that first, and then we'll move into uh, chapter one. And you might be thinking, wow, we've been in this course for a while, and Pastor Polzing hasn't even gotten to the first chapter. <clears throat> That's just the way that I teach. So that's the way it goes. <laughs> All right, but let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for all of the ways in which you are uh, merciful and generous towards us. We thank you for your word, uh, through whom we know our, uh, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is our sure and steady foundation. And so we thank you for that foundation for every day of our lives. We ask that you bless this time that we now have together to study that word and to consider our life together as the body of Christ. We pray all of this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. So uh, we left off, like I said, at the end of the introduction, part two, uh, with considering why are we studying life together? Why did I choose this book? Why is this topic important to us? And so to start this off, I'd like to go to the book of Hebrews, open our Bibles, go to Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 through 2. And does someone have that who'd like to read? Mike? Okay. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, so this section comes right after we had looked at um, all of those other Bible verses about uh community uh, and the Christian community. So if you just let your eyes sort of scan up the page there, if you were here, uh, you, you see how we've talked about community and how important it is, its characteristics as described in scripture. But here's another one, uh, just another point that I think is uh, very important. And um, it has to do with the cloud of witnesses. Now that we've taken as um, if you look to Hebrews 11, you see a great chapter of going through many of the, the saints and the people of faith before, who have gone before us uh, that the author of Hebrews lays out. And so we, we take that not only as those who are mentioned explicitly there, but all those who have gone before us. And so I ask the question, what is the value of studying the lives of others, particularly Christians who have gone before us? I think there are many answers here. Yeah, Kathy? To serve as an example to us how to live. Okay, so to serve as an example of how to live. And certainly that's a good thing. I'm sure all of us can think of role models of faith in our lives uh, for us personally, as well as maybe publicly. There might be a public person we're thinking of that is good as an example. And I think that's certainly true. So an example, okay? Now, what's important to remember about saints who have gone before us? Are they any more or less sinful than we are? No, 
Now, hopefully, if we're using them as a role model, they led a public life of faith and, and good values and things like that. We're not expecting them to be perfect any more than we would expect to be perfect. So they are forgiven uh, sinners uh, as well as God's saints. Okay, so an example for us, that's good. What else? What's the value? I'm thinking particularly of people who have gone through difficulties or even persecution for their faith. What is the value of learning about and hearing about those Christians? Yep. Faithful even up to the point of death. Okay, so they remain faithful even up to perhaps the point of death. And what does that do for us? It strengthens us. Gives us hope. Jane? I, I think it gives us, a, excuse me, an example to follow, like you said before, also yeah. an inspiration. Yeah. Kind right. of the strength to say they endured and, per, and pers, persevered. And with God's help, I can do the same. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you said the key there, you know, with God's help, we know that they wouldn't be able to do what they did in their life had it not been without God's help. In fact, you go back again to Hebrews 11 and read through that. It's actually recounting what the Lord did for each of these people, right? How God's faithfulness extended to them. And so, by extension, we can remember that God's faithfulness to us so that we can uh, go into perhaps even persecution and faith and uh, uh, death and difficulties in this life and know that just as God was faithful to them, so will he be to us. So it is an encouragement and an inspiration. Absolutely. I think the other thing uh, why... Uh, uh, and this comes up time and time again, uh, we give thanks to God for them and for what he did for them. Again, remembering that he does the same for us. So there's a lot of value to studying the lives of others, particularly Christians who have gone before us. Okay, so um, I bring that up because as we think about community, we're thinking about not only those with whom we are immediately, but also just the wide community of saints. We have this phrase in the creed called the communion, the community of saints. I believe in the communion, the community of saints. We're going to talk a lot more about that, especially as we get into chapter one, but, um, but that is what we are confessing and believing. Now, this next question here, I want you to ref reflect a little bit. If someone were to come up to you and ask you what the state of Christian community in the United States is today, what would you say? What would you say is the state of Christian community in the United States? Might be a tough question, but. Okay, so a lot of things we could say. Divided is one word that comes to mind. All right. Smaller, okay, just numerically, it seems to be shrinking. Jane? Okay, and yet, what's that? See how valuable it is. Yes, okay, so and yet stronger, because we see how valuable it is. So even if it may be smaller, those who are in this community, and again, it's not just us, it's the wider community of Christians, see how important it is. Kathy? When, when we travel, we're always like, it's surprised when we meet other Christians, right? So we're all out there, but we're all just kind of, um, it's not an assumption anymore that the person that you're meeting is part of of this community right okay you know? yeah so it's um uh, but every there's still a lot out there it's just i don't i wouldn't say we've gone into hiding but you know it's just not an assumption anymore yeah i think yeah, there was a time when you could at least nominally assume people were christians 
And I don't think we're in that time anymore is what you're describing. It's not the standard norm, the average norm. It's not that there aren't a lot of Christians. There are, but it's maybe just not the accepted norm. Okay. I think all those are fair. Now, why do you think, what do you think has contributed to this? Why are things the way they are? Yeah, Carolyn. I think part of it is just the, the greater community at large with the growth of, I guess what you guys usually say nuns or the yeah. people who believe in nothing. The non-affiliated. The non-affiliated ones. Now you can even go, you see another Christian, even if they're a different denomination, if you know they still believe in the same creeds, it's like, yay, I found somebody I can agree with. <sighs> and there's a little bit more unity across even denomination lines with, in some aspects for things where it just knowing some of those things are the same. It's, yeah. It means more than in the past where things that you would think would be common sense weren't really, you know, mm -hmm. questioned, but now it's kind of a topsy-turvy world. Right. So long, sorry. Thank you, Carolyn. Mark? This is probably a little difficult, but I think also because we've had a pretty easy time of things in a lot of ways yeah so that's not true for everyone but it's as christians in the united states we have not experienced a lot of persecution at least not in our longer past and so we're complacent and right. we don't necessarily feel the strong need to heal the divisions and to have a strong community i think a lot of us you know we travel we we enjoy that we look for it but a lot of people don't right we talked about persecution worldwide that, that's going on today. And so relatively speaking, even if our culture isn't nominally Christian anymore, um, we still have great liberty compared to them. And even that we may still take for granted. So there's a sense that when things are difficult, and, and this is true not only for our lives of faith, but just in life in general, when things are difficult, it has a way of iron sharpening iron. It has a way of uh, a homing in on what is truly important. And I think, Jane, that's kind of what you were talking about before. Even if our, even if our community might be smaller, it, we've, we've seen its value, especially in recent years. What's happened recently that affected Christian community? COVID. COVID, the pandemic. And I think two things happened. I think one, I think, unfortunately, many people who uh, took for granted that community and maybe didn't appreciate its value have wandered outside that community now, and they're, they're, they're the ones not back in churches, and not just here, but that's everywhere. But, you know, what, what were we feeling when we couldn't meet together or were, had difficulty meeting together? We were we desired to be together, right? And I think that shows the impulse we have as Christians to be together. Mary Rose, you shared with us a few weeks ago, what did people miss the most statistically? Besides the sacrament, which is excellent. I'm glad that that's there. Coffee fellowship hour. Coffee fellowship hour. <laughs> which in a non-theological way is sort of like another Lutheran sacrament. No, 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 it's not. Let's not get confused here. <clears throat> But it's really high up there, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, but, but what it speaks to is the time we spend together is important, and that's obviously true. Yeah. Um, I'll say one more thing about why I think community is the way that this is. American Christianity, American Christianity, what's the, who's, who's studying? There's a small group, I think it's one of our home groups, that's studying uh, the book, Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? Is anyone in that group that's studying it? Excellent book. Excellent book. It's by Pastor Matt Richard. Will the real Jesus please stand up? Um, but And then there's another book by um, a colleague of his, Brian Wolfmuller, who wrote a book called Has American Christianity Failed? But in any sense, in our history in this country of uh, Christianity, we are marked, and this is not just, this isn't Lutherans primarily, although we are certainly affected by it, 
American Christianity has emphasized the individual over community. That is what marks American Christianity, that, that it's, all ba- it's all focused on your conversion moment, your time you made a decision for Jesus, your personal relationship with Jesus, you accepting Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Do you recognize those um, keywords, right? Those aren't words that Lutherans often say. But those are words that are just rife in American Christianity because it emphasizes, it overemphasizes, I would critique, your individual relationship with Jesus. And the reason why I say it overemphasizes it is because it's not that Jesus doesn't love you personally and came to this world to save you personally. He has. But he has made you. In baptism, we are adopted into the family of God. I am a child of God, which by definition makes me brothers and sisters, have brothers and sisters with everyone else in that family. And so where Christ is, there are his children, there is his family. There is the body of Christ. And I think American Christianity spent a lot of years overemphasizing the individual, and now we're just sort of reaping what we've sown in this country, which is people saying, I can be a Christian on my own. I don't need the church. I don't need a community. And we would say, based on what we've discussed so far in this class, that that's not quite right. When we are a Christian, it means we are part of a community. Why is Christian community important for us at Christ our King Lutheran Church? Why is it important here? We need to work together as a team for what purpose? To our Lord and Savior. To promote our Lord and Savior, to make his name known, right? Our theme this year? Only Jesus. It's always and always has been all about Jesus. And that no other name that comes from Acts when the apostles said there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. So our goal is to make that name known. And we do it by working together. Okay, what else? Why else is it important? Brenda and Mike. Oh, Brenda first. Go ahead. To support and encourage one another in our working together. To support and encourage one another, right? This is a cloud of witnesses. This is a body of Christ. We, we're not lone rangers here. We do it together to support and encourage one another. And Mike? To be re-energized, you know, being in this fellowship of uh, other Christians. Yeah, good to be re-energized. Kathy? We can do more with together as a community. I think there's a certain pastor here who talks about that. <laughs> we absolutely can. Uh, again, yeah, we're not just, I've got to go save the world, right? No, we do what we can together for the sake of our wider community, which is Celine and beyond. Let me know if this situation has ever occurred to you. Let's say you know something to be true. You know something to be true, like you are loved and forgiven by God. But has anyone ever had the experience where something you know in your head doesn't connect with what you're feeling in your heart? So you go, okay, I know I'm loved and forgiven, but boy, today, for whatever reason, I don't feel like it. What do you need at that moment? God's promises, which do they just fall out of heaven to you? Okay, get them from here. So yes, you can open up your Bible and do it. Sometimes we aren't so great at doing that. So what else could happen? Kathy? You need to be reminded. By by, who? By the pastor, by, you know, uh, your fellow parishioners. Yes. You need to be reminded. Yes. And this is something we're going to talk. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This is something we're going to talk about. The something important in our Lutheran theology is an emphasis on the external word. In other words, I don't find God somewhere deep down in the recesses of my heart. God comes from outside of myself. He is not me. And that's important because I can't save myself. He comes to me and saves me. So we emphasize the external word, God coming to us, Jesus coming to our world, the word coming to me. 
And sometimes I can't generate that. Yes, I have the Holy Spirit at work within me, but sometimes I am down. And I need other Christians to bring that word, that encouragement, God's promises to me. And we all do. And that's what the church and that's what the community is here for. All right, so that's the end of introduction part two. Any comments or questions about any of that? Pastor Mark. I have a Michigan uh, news. There is a, a notice that there is a meeting in the greater Detroit area, I believe, for grandparents who are struggling to be or give a witness to their grandchildren because their children are not doing much of a job of, of leading their children in the right direction. Mm. How, how can we effectively minister? That's a good example of Christians getting together yeah. to, to be community in order to, to make community in their families. All right. So there's in the Lutheran witness, you said? Yes, in the, the Michigan. The Michigan in touch? Yes. Okay, which is found in the Lutheran Witness. Uh, there's something for to encourage grandparents uh, how to share God's word with grandchildren, especially in situations where they may not be getting it from their parents. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a shameless plug. Um, prayer breakfast on October 8th. Is that right? Uh, the topic is, make sure I get it right, is praying for those who are lost, so, and especially people we know that are lost. Uh, so there's another opportunity for where this congregation is coming together in prayer and um, uh, and we're, we're going to pray for and talk about those in our lives for whom we have deep concern. And it's going to be good to be together for that. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so chapter one. <clears throat> now, let me just remind you. For those of you who might be new today, uh, we are going through the book Life Together. However, I'm going to teach this class where you don't have to read the book if you don't want to, so don't feel like you have to. If you'd like to, please go for it. We have copies in the Welcome Center. Um, but if you'd like to read ahead, I've given you a reading schedule of what we're going to be covering. We're going to be spending two, if not three weeks in chapter one, just because there's a lot to unpack that sets up the rest of the book. Um, but uh, part one is pages 17 through 26. So that's where we are. But again, if you just like to come and listen to what we're talking about, that'll, that'll work too. All right. So I'd like to take just a couple minutes at your table. Um, and we're, we're just going to do this for two or three minutes. So it's going to be somewhat quick. Um, I'd like you to think about a time in your life when you lacked Christian community. Now, that may have been recently with the pandemic, but also think about the rest of your life. When was a time when you didn't have that visible Christian community around you? And think about how it made you feel and what did it lead you to want to do? So when was a time in your life when you lacked Christian community and how did it make you feel and what did it lead you to want to do? So uh, just take a, a, a quick moment to think about that and then share with those at your table. We'll come back together in like three minutes.
All right, we're going to come back together. Hopefully you had some opportunity to share when Christian community was important to you, uh, how it made you feel, and then maybe what it led you to want to do. Hopefully, when we lack community, it increases all the more the desire to be part of community again. Um, let's talk a little bit, uh, because we, we don't want to take Christian community for granted, um, even though that's a uh, temptation to do, especially when we've been around it all our lives. Let's just remember a few things, and just quickly here, how did Jesus lack community in his life when he was here on earth? When were times of his life that he lacked community? Brenda? He didn't have a home. <laughs> yeah. Um, other than growing up with his parents, but then right. when, you know, he kind of left home. And he also, I my first thought was though, he was the leader. He didn't have to, um, I wouldn't say have to. He didn't have the advantage of learning together with the other disciples and the other people around him he already knew he was right. the leader yeah so he was kind of by himself leadership can be a lonely spot and um uh that's true um yeah jesus said uh about your first comment uh you know the birds of the air have nests foxes have dens but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head and he's saying that look he's not complaining he's just saying if you're following me realize that this is the life of a Christian at times. Okay, so he spent his youth in a foreign land. Where was he, Larry? Egypt. He was in Egypt. So his life was in danger. So an angel warned his father, Joseph, to take him down into Egypt. And of course, this was a great callback to the Israelites' time in Egypt and God's deliverance out of Egypt. But how many other Jewish people do you think were in Egypt worshiping together? I mean, we don't know, but it was very isolating, I'm sure. He was, also, he was also surrounded by people that didn't care for him. Yeah, he was opposed by enemies. That's very... They did it in secret. We're over... Okay, so you're talking about like the Christians and such, they met in secret? Uh, Jesus and his parents uh, went to worship, supposedly. Oh, I see, okay. They had uh, exits in case they were discovered that they could quick disperse. I see, okay. That uh, microphone is not great. <clears throat> it just keeps cutting out. Uh, Donna, let's try this one. Right here, Donna. Thank you. Well, the leaders of the church of his day um, wanted nothing to do with him. Uh, so he he didn't, certainly didn't have any community with them, so to speak. Right. Yeah. They were definitely against all the things he was doing. Right. Absolutely. When was the moment of just utter lack of community? When is the pinnacle of lack of com community for Jesus? Why have you forsaken me? Yeah, at the cross. His disciples fled. Uh, they were gone. And because Jesus was bearing the sins of the whole world, his father turned away from even his son because Jesus on the cross became sin for us, became the curse for us. So Jesus certainly in his life lacked community. How did the early Christians lack community in their lives? This kind of goes along with Gerald's comment. The disciples and, uh, and all those early Christians. What was life like for them? Yeah, Jennifer? I don't think they were too wanted. I'm sorry. I don't think they were too wanted um, in the, you know, they were kind of dispersed all over, but they're okay. kind of doing it in semi-secret. Yeah. Me meetings in homes and things like that. 
Um, in fact, there's some parts where, you know, they couldn't sing together, even though scripture encourages us to sing, because if they sang, they would make too much noise and too much attention drawn upon themselves. So in the Roman Empire, you know, Christians were not um, appreciated all that much, you could say. Uh, you mentioned another word, they were dispersed. It, they were all throughout the Roman Empire. Um, so there wasn't, you know, meeting in homes, meeting in secret, perhaps, uh, meeting. And yet, it's kind of amazing when you think about it, the community that they still had, even despite those hardships. So it, it goes to show how God blessed them even in those circumstances. Larry? Uh, someone wrote a poem during the time when the pandemic, that first Easter, yeah. we were in our, our own homes, right? hiding. They compared it. That, that was probably the closest we'd been to the first Easter. Yeah. Well, my next question is, how do we lack community? And so I think you're right. I think we experienced just a little bit of that, perhaps during the pandemic. How else do we lack community? I think we kind of look to ourselves and um, think we got to do it ourselves. It's, I don't know, a U.S. Uh, mentality, pick yourself up from your bootstrap sort of thing. Yeah, right. That is very pervasive in our uh, mentality. Uh, you're right. Linda. We also don't um, focus our social lives in the church. Um, we follow our kids in whatever sports they're in, and we get into our own activities, and we often are too busy for um, Christian community, I think. Yeah. Used to be that you just, you know, everything was centered around the church, and now it's not. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm not optimistic that we can reclaim that as a culture, <laughs> uh, if I'm being honest. However, I will say, there is a lot more that we can be doing, uh, myself included. Um, just thinking, stopping and thinking, what do I want my life to be full of? And what do I want to be raising my kids or grandkids or whoever's in our lives? Um, what, what priorities do I want them to have? And then building out your schedule from there. And so I recognize, you know, we are going to probably only get, you know, families who's, you know, there's a war on their schedules these days. That's just the way the world is right now. If you want to be a part of something, it requires ultimate commitment. So for better, for worse, that's just the way things are. But we aim, you know, I, I talk about this when we start every confirmation years with the families, when I'm talking to the parents, we aim to have that community, that grounding on a Sunday morning, on a Wednesday night, I said, if everyone came on a Sunday morning and a Wednesday night, and obviously things come up and you're not going to make it hundred percent of the time, but if you're there every single time you can be, boy, that makes such a difference. And, you know, I'm sure you've heard the statistics, um, you know, kids with parents who go to church have like a 75% chance that they're going to continue in the, in the faith. You start taking away one parent at a time or you get down to zero parents who the kids have seen going to church, it's like 1% chance of them remaining in the faith. I mean, it's just drastic. So the most important thing that we can do for the next generation is to participate in the community ourselves. It's not rocket science. It's just, are you here? And obviously that's just not only important for them, but it's important for us as well. Again, we talked about the importance of hearing that external word. We need to hear something from outside of ourselves that fills us with hope in life, right? We can't have that unless we're here. And so it's important all the way around. Okay, um, let's go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, verses 12 through 19. And Ed, you're going to read that? But before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. 
They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. This will result in your being witnesses to them. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed, even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain life. Okay. So what does Jesus indicate will occur to his disciples and to many more who follow him? Persecution? They will be brought before kings and governors. Verse 16, who's delivering them up? Parents and brothers and relatives and friends. Some of you they will put to death. How does the world feel about us? Verse 17. Loved? No. Hated. But despite all that, what are Jesus' promises to us in these verses? What, there are many things. What does he promise us? Okay, so he'll give us the words. Right, yeah. So he will be with us. And verse 13, that these, you know, we might say, oh, woe is me. But these are actually opportunities to do what, verse 13? To witness. Seems kind of paradoxical that in moments of intense persecution, they can be the greatest times of witness for the gospel. All right, so even though we'll be delivered all delivered up, verse 18, what will happen to us? Not a hair of your head will perish. Now, that seems interesting. Jesus just said, some of you they will put to death in verse 16. So what's he talking about there? Eternal life. He's telling them they can do whatever they want to you realize this, but they can't touch your eternal life. That's very encouraging. We know that there is something greater than even this life. Um, I know that Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when he was imprisoned and put in concentration camps and, you know, risked all for the work that he felt Christ was leading him to do, um, I'm, I'm sure that these were essential promises from Christ uh, to keep him going. And, and like we talked about, he was he acted as pastor for those in those camps with him. So he was able to bring that hope and that life uh, to many people. All right, so we actually kind of talked about it uh, a little bit before getting into what Bonhoeffer brings up in the first chapter. He gets fairly quickly into a, a thought here where he says, according to God's will, Christendom is a scattered people. So when he says Christendom, he's talking about the greater Christian community. Christendom is a scattered people, scattered like seed into all the kingdoms of the earth. That is its curse and its promise. Now, this idea of scattering is, is very um, prevalent in the Bible. God's people in the Old Testament were scattered during the exile. That is when, when nations came to destroy Israel and they were taken off into foreign lands. But God's promise to them was what? That I will bring back a remnant and preserve that remnant who will receive the promised Christ. This theme comes up again in the New Testament when Jesus says, you will go into all nations to the very ends of the earth, and you also will be like a scattered people, right? Um, 
and and what Bonhoeffer is saying in this first chapter is that it's both a curse and a promise. So how is this scattering, us being dispersed? How is that a curse? What is its negative? Brenda? It takes away our Christian community. Okay, so it, it can take away our Christian community or at least run it very, very thin, right? Uh, book of the Bible, kind of quintessential exile type um, uh, account of what, what life was like. Uh, book of Daniel. What happened to Daniel when he was faithfully worshiping God even in a foreign country? Thrown into the lion's den. What about his friends, Meshach, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? You have to say them in order, otherwise you don't get them right. They refused to bow down to the idol. What happened to them? Ruin the fiery furnace. Did they perish? No. So even though they were in a community where community was very, very thin, if not non-existent, uh, they found that God was always faithful to them. And so this kind of ties into how is the scattering a promise? I, I, I put, what he's getting at, it's also a blessing. We remember that God is faithful to us even in those times, first of all. But how else is this a blessing? Brenda? I appreciate, I appreciate you, Brenda. I just want you to know. Uh, it, <clears throat> it's a blessing because um, it would spread the word of God ah. even more. See, this gets back to Luke 21. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Right. How will they believe if they have not heard? So what are we called to do? Go into all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and Jesus says, teaching them all I have commanded you. So a scattering, we say, well, how could that be God's will? But we've heard from Jesus, and we, and we hear Bonhoeffer referring to it, God's got a plan. And even though things might be difficult, this is, even when Christian community seems like, well, Shouldn't God want us to be the strongest community? We're all gathered together. There is no fracturing. Nothing bad is happening. Realize that sometimes the best thing for the gospel is allowing that community, at least the visible community, right? Our community in Christ is never broken, but that visible community to run thin a little bit and recognize that God is still working through it. All right, so he says, so between the death of Christ and the last day, it is only by a gracious anticipation of the last things that Christians are privileged to live in fellowship, visible fellowship with other Christians. Let me read that one more time. So between the death of Christ and the last day, it is only by a gracious anticipation of the last things that Christians are privileged to live in visible fellowship with other Christians. We're talking about visible fellowship. We're talking about this. We're talking about literally, visibly being together, even though sometimes that's not possible. So what does our visible fellowship anticipate, according to that quote? What, what are we anticipating by being together? Heaven. Okay, heaven. But let me just clarify, because by heaven, people might mean different things. Right? When we die, we believe our bodies are buried and our soul goes to live with Christ. Jesus says, those who believe in me shall never die, right? John 11. So we believe that to be true. We believe our loved ones who have gone before us in the faith are with Christ at his side right now, or like we hear in our gospel reading today by Abraham's side. Is that existence of soul, not body, our eternal existence? Is that what, how it's going to be forever? Soul, not body? No, it's not. So even those in heaven, they're not going to be there forever when we define heaven as that place. Jesus says, I will come again. To do what? To raise us up in both body and soul. Our perishable bodies, which were buried, are going to be raised. And people always say, well, what about you know people who are lost at sea or burned in a fire? It's like, God can handle it. Don't worry. He will raise your body. 
uh, and we will live in an imperishable body. And I always say, just look to Jesus post Easter. We will have a body like his scripture says, and we will so live with him in the new heavens and the new earth in a physical existence, not just floating in the crowds one day, but not only with Christ, with also who else? All saints. You see, right now, there's, there is somewhat of a break of fellowship. Uh, we, 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 we do not have a break in the, the communion of saints, that is those in heaven and, and those here on earth, but are we visibly together right now? No. So even now, there isn't perfect visible fellowship with the church triumphant and the church militant is what the terms that we use. But on the day when Jesus comes again and all are raised, there is a perfect fellowship again, right? So heaven, defined by the place where our souls go, is not the eternal dwelling place that we're looking forward to. We are looking forward to it. Don't get me wrong. It will be good to be with the Lord and with our loved ones who have gone before us. But until the day Christ comes again, there's not that perfect fellowship of of saints, of ones made holy by the blood of Christ. So anytime that we do have visible fellowship, like we're having right now, and like we have every time we gather, we are anticipating the day when that perfect, that perfect fellowship is to come. It's like a little microcosm. It's like a little, little sneak preview. You know, you see the, the previews in the movie. Does anyone go to movie theaters anymore? I like going to movie theaters still. You see the, the coming attractions, right? That's what we should call church on Sunday. Come join us for the coming attraction. The coming attraction of what? Of when Jesus comes back. It's a little slice of heaven here on earth. How does this help us when visible fellowship is not possible? And let me just give you an example that he quotes, Bonhoeffer does. The imprisoned, the sick, the scattered lonely, the proclaimers of the gospel in heathen lands. Those are people who are lacking visible fellowship. The imprisoned, the sick, the scattered lonely, the proclaimers of the gospel in heathen lands. But we can think of maybe some of our own shut-in members, those who physically can't be here. Maybe those who are imprisoned. You know, I know many of you are in contact with people who are in prison currently. Those who are in the hospital and want to be in church but can't. So how does this, know, how does knowing what our visible fellowship is anticipating, which is the, the day when Christ returns, how does that help us when we can't have visible fellowship? We are looking forward to the day when we will have that fellowship. So uh, hope. So what can you say to someone who lacks the ability to be in visible fellowship with someone? That their situation is permanent? No. You can tell them, you are doing good for the sake of God. Look forward to the day when God will make this right too. And that inspires us all. So we recognize we, we don't take community for granted. Our life together is a blessing. This is what Bonhoeffer says. He says, the physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. How often when you walk into church, do you think about that? When you see your brothers and sisters and you say, these men and women are a source of incomparable joy and strength to me. We've been talking about it all day, but what blessings do we derive from life together with other Christians? Strength, encouragement, joy, fellowship. I am thankful someone brewed the coffee today. Thanks be to God. And Pastor Don. <laughs> Good coffee, Pastor Don. 
And I am thankful for Pastor, this is what I thought you were saying at first, <laughs> Pastor Don brought us God's word during the sermon today. I am thankful for that. Well, thank you. I have a problem with this congregation. They laugh too much. Yeah. You know, sometimes you just say, you got to stop laughing here or something. Yeah. We need some pastors who are good at telling jokes. Jokes, right. <laughs> no, we need some pastors. I'll tell Pastor good Tom jokes. that. Yeah, well, okay, yeah, good jokes. That's a good qualification. That's a yes. long growing <laughs> One of the things that uh, there's also you derive, derive um, no, do I, when you're separated from the community, having been with the community, you know that there are still in the, those in the community who continue to pray for you and support you, even when you can't see it. Yeah. Um, when Dietrich Bonhoeffer was in prison in Germany, Less than 200 miles away, Laura Edge's father was a prisoner in Germany, a prisoner of war. And Laura gave us a, um, a, a, a spoke at the Young at Heart this past week. Yeah, on Thursday. And on Thursday to talk about the death march and everything. As she explained the situation that the prisoners were living in, you know, all the fleas, the lice, the lack of food, the lack of clothing, the lack of shelter, the coldest winter on record in that, in that area. One of the things that really impressed me was they were able to gather for community and, and worship at various times. And that was especially yeah. true the day, was it the day before or two days before they left on the march? And I can imagine that that group of worshiping just two days before they left on the uh, death march, not knowing where they were going or if they were going to survive, mm -hmm. how that must have given them encouragement and hope to look for the future and also to understand that even though they were not together as they marched along, they were still together in support for one right, another. Right. Great point. Thank you. And thank you, Laura, again, for sharing that with us this week. Um, and I think you're right. I think when we say to people, um, I'm praying for you, and 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 we do, and they know that we are, how how many of us have drawn great joy and strength and encouragement from that well i'd like to end with this quote and we'll pick up here next time it says it is easily forgotten that the fellowship of christian brethren is a gift of grace that any day may be taken from us therefore let him who until now has had the privilege of living a common christian life with other christians praise god's grace from the bottom of his heart so we do not take this for granted. We give thanks to God every single day that he allows us to live in fellowship, in community with others and with him and with him. Okay, um, let's close with a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we do have community with one another because we first have community with you. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to reconcile us despite our sin to you because of his perfect righteousness. And so we thank you for this gift. Help us to appreciate and give thanks to you for the gift of fellowship with one another so that we may live in this community, not for the sake of ourselves, but for the sake of others and for the sake of the world who does not yet know you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And last uh, quick announcement, if you haven't already uh, gotten your photo, please go to room 10 so we can update our church directory and have a good community in that way. Thank you.